30 years after the Cold War, Russia's President Vladimir Putin is once more sending out ships to sea armed with nuclear weapons. The move has alarmed NATO and the rest of the world, especially as the situation in Ukraine deteriorates further and the war approaches its one-year anniversary on February 24th. Norway has traditionally been NATO's frontline naval picket against Russian seafaring forces. The nation has... Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. My name's Ryan. I'm a former commando from the United Kingdom and today... We're going to react to Putin prepares for World War III as Russia deploys nuclear armed warships. This is a video from the infographic show. As always, guys, link will be in the description. Go show some support. It's um, one of the top five channels on the, on YouTube, I believe, guys, at this moment in time. So go show them some love, troops. They seem to let me um, react to their videos, so that's good, guys. We're going to continue to uh, hopefully do them justice. But before we get into it, please like, share, and subscribe to my channel. I really would appreciate that troops okay got some big big news coming very very soon as soon as i can let you know i will do let's get into it has invested heavily with the aid of its nato partners in ocean monitoring capabilities knowing that it would be on the front line of any confrontation between nato and the warsaw pact keeping track of exactly what ships and how many of them made the transit toward the atlantic could mean the difference between victory or defeat at sea Thus, the nation was the first to sound the alarm about the departure of a number of vessels from the Russian Northern Fleet, all of which were equipped with nuclear weapons. This marks the first time that Russian surface ships have taken to sea armed with nukes since the end of the Cold War, when global nuclear tensions finally eased after decades of hair-trigger alert. Details remain scarce at the moment, but it appears as if the ships are armed with the same tactical nuclear weapons they would have carried back in the battle days of the Cold War. Russian nuclear weapons... Mm, okay, so do you think that Putin is really preparing for World War III um, and has the potential to use nuclear warheads? I honestly, in my head, don't ever see it happening. But a lot of people do. Are you yeah or near with that regard? At sea is nothing new. Russian ballistic missile submarines have been patrolling the world's oceans on a near constant state of readiness, at least when they aren't accidentally blowing themselves up and sinking. As part of Russia's nuclear triad, these nuclear armed ballistic missile submarines do the same job that the American counterparts do ensure an element of nuclear deterrence can survive a surprise first strike. Typically, Russia's nuclear boats remain close to its shores and under the relative safety of the polar ice cap, as it's no secret that their submarines are priority number one target targets for the U.S. Navy. In fact, for much of the second half of the Cold War, U.S. attack subs regularly followed Russian nuclear boats on their patrols, ready to blow them out of the water before they could launch their weapons. Listen, guys, the United States know exactly where these boats are anywhere. Let's get that straight, all right? They're not going to allow a country like Russia to just freely have nuclear uh, armed warships wherever they please. Um, the surveillance on these things will be through the roof. And I'm talking about sophisticated surveillance, uh, the, that of which the world doesn't even know exists. The Americans will definitely have top-notch surveillance on um, on these nuclear armed warships. So, I mean, it's priority number one, as they already explained. This was largely thanks to the advantage in silencing and sensor technology. <laughs> there we go. So we've got surveillance system. I took the words right out of my mouth. That the U.S. enjoyed, as well as its formidable SOSIS underwater surveillance system. A trader revealed the capabilities of SOSIS to the Soviets, and the Soviet Navy made great strides in silencing their new boats, making it difficult for U.S. subs to continue tracking them. Just to be safe, though, Russian nuclear subs continue to remain close to shore, where they can be supported by aircraft and are harder to track through polar ice. Yeah, but that's also limiting their capability as well. Okay, if you think about it logically. What makes the recent deployment of Russian ships such a provocation then is the fact that these ships are taking to sea with nukes for an entirely different purpose. Rather than carrying long-range ballistic nuclear missiles, Russian surface ships known as Kirov battle cruisers carry short-range tactical nuclear weapons. These nukes had one and only one job during the Cold War 
take on American carrier battle groups. The Soviet Union knew that victory in Europe would depend entirely on making sure the U.S. Navy was unable to secure the convoy routes for its heavy material making the transit from the U.S. to Europe. But to threaten U.S. convoys, it would have to face down the might of America's carrier battle groups. This was no easy proposition for a nation with no aircraft carriers of its own. And this is the entire reason the Kirov-class nuclear-powered battle cruisers were developed. Taking on U.S. carriers with long-range bombers was an option, but a very expensive one. The Soviet Union expected it would have to expend 100 bomber aircraft armed with long-range anti-ship missiles to take down a single U.S. carrier. And right, those numbers alone should let you know that that's just not viable, okay? Um, sacrificing 100 of those things is insane, especially when you think, well, okay, well, maybe it's worth taking out one of those supercarriers. Not really. The amount that America has, it's not even going to dent slightly the um, overall armament, okay? So it's, it's just going to be a pointless waste of what you've got. There's other areas in which they can utilize that more. So it doesn't look good for them, <laughs> thankfully so. And fully expected that not a single bomber would make the return trip home. Even with the vast numbers of Soviet weapons, this was simply not a feasible option for taking on up to a dozen of America's supercarriers, requiring the sacrifice of 1,200 Soviet bombers and their crews. Thus, the battle cruiser was developed, powered by a nuclear reactor with armor to make even the biggest World War II battleships weep. The logic was simple. If carrier battle groups can't be destroyed from the air, then it would come down to a slugging match between ships, and the Kirov class was well suited for swapping body blows with the U.S. Navy's surface ships, all of which it outmassed by many tons. A Kirov battlecruiser would shrug off American Harpoon anti-ship missiles until it was close enough to launch its massive granite anti-ship missiles. Each granite carried a warhead of up to 1,600 pounds of high explosives, Whoa. compared to the puny 488-pound warhead of American Harpoons. Mm, that is, yeah, that's a large difference, guys. But U.S. air defenses were formidable, and even... Look at that. I know it's just a shot and an old one of that, but them nuclear warheads are just insanely powerful. The devastation that they can cause. These images are we shouldn't we should not be viewing this. We should never have had the opportunity to view this type of destruction as a human in our species. This is just otherworldly, guys. Supersonic granites make for big targets. That's why Soviet fleets could also carry tactical nuclear weapons. With nuclear weapons, precision is entirely optional, and even a wide miss by a 50 megaton warhead could cause serious damage to a U.S. surface action group. When you consider that a Russian fleet could carry dozens of these weapons alongside the big granite anti-ship missiles, it was enough to give any American air defense operator a rather big headache. Russia's modern redeployment of tactical nuclear weapons on its ships can mean only one thing. Thing. It's once more preparing to use nuclear weapons against a far superior NATO naval force. During the Cold War, the Russian fleet was outclassed by just the U.S. Today, the odds are even more firmly stacked against it, as Russia's navy has seen massive neglect since the end of the Cold War. We've heard this story time and time again. Neglect, neglect, neglect. Russia not taking care of what it's got. So what do you have? You have an old Russ bucket military not capable of deploying for longer periods of time because your tanks are just not capable of doing it. They break, they rust, they don't even work in the first place. What kind of military is this? Let's be honest, guys. It's an absolute shambles. But nuclear weapons are very, very good at leveling the playing field. Yet all is not as it seems. The news seems bad. If Russia is deploying nuclear weapons on its surface vessels, then some fear that it might be preparing to stop U.S. reinforcements traveling to Europe once more, like in the Cold War. This would hint at the widening of the conflict in Ukraine, perhaps a preparation for a direct war against NATO. To say that this would be suicidal is an understatement. For starters, no Russian surface vessel could ever come within firing range of a NATO battle group. With NATO forces enjoying air dominance thanks to its fleet of aircraft carriers and NATO submarines prowling the Atlantic and NATO would absolutely, absolutely destroy Russia. Like, like seriously, yes, what they could do in retaliation with nuclear warheads would be destructive enough, but uh, take that aside, we would absolutely batter them, all right? Absolutely batter them. It, it would be unbelievable how much destruction would be caused, all right? But we have got the nuclear threat, and once the 
once the button gets pushed with that, it's bad for everyone, including of Russian aggression, these nuclear armed vessels would very quickly become nuclear armed artificial reefs. As usual, Russia's deployment of nuclear weapons is nothing more than silly posturing. As the war in Ukraine turns increasingly against it and NATO begins to move on sending heavy equipment to Ukraine, Russia must turn to increasingly desperate tactics to try to deter NATO support. To be blunt, the Russian military would be absolutely annihilated in a conventional war against NATO in Europe. And that was before its losses in Ukraine. Factoring in current losses and troop commitments in Ukraine, NATO going to war against Russia would be the equivalent of John Cena dropkicking a baby seal in the chest. <laughs> Russia has nothing left with which to intimidate or coerce NATO into stopping its support for Ukraine, except nuclear weapons. This is why Putin has stopped his nuclear saber-rattling, but has done nothing about letting his subordinates make all the nuclear threats they want. In fact, it's extremely probable that this is by design. After catching flack and losing political support for his vague nuclear threats last year, Putin has put on the facade of a responsible world leader and passed the nuclear blackmail and intimidation onto every other member of his government. His goal is simple, to make you, our dear viewer terrified of a nuclear conflict the more the yeah and that's what he's done with a lot of people not me though you you've heard my stance on the channel for this long it's i just don't believe it's going to happen a, pe a period i just don't media talks about nukes and the more they bring up quote escalation end quote the more scared europeans become and the less likely they are to continue supporting ukraine and that's why it's important to have a sober attitude about any nuclear threats from Russia or the deployment of tactical nuclear weapons on its North Sea vessels. These ships pose no threat to Europeans and would be sunk before launching their weapons in case of a war. Putin is a lot of things, but he's not suicidal and he's not a lunatic as many try to portray him. Fa mm, not a lunatic. Um, you know, I disagree with that. I think he is a lunatic. I think he's a lunatic. Just put yourself in the shoes of um, someone who has the ability and power to to kill people indirectly through their military. How many people is this guy responsible for killing? Can you let one of those people... Could you let that on your conscience? I couldn't. I was in the military. Or I was in the, 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 top, the top part of the British military. I couldn't have that on my soul. This guy's got it on his soul, rest and easy, not bothered. Only a lunatic can do that, guys. Fact is, you're on the front line of an information war for the fate of Ukraine, and the survival of the Ukrainian people as well as Europe's security future is in your hands. What if NATO and the US wanted to neutralize these ships though? What options are on the table? First thing would be fixing the positions of these ships. Thankfully, NATO has an extensive capability to detect and track Russian ships. Very, very extensive. Something it's been doing since the earliest days of the Cold War. Yeah. A system of underwater sensors and shore-based radars stretching from Greenland to Norway would be used to detect and track the small Russian fleet, supplemented by airborne assets stationed in Norway and Britain. If push came to shove or NATO believed these ships posed an immediate threat, the alliance could choose to escalate to kinetic solutions. It's safe to assume that nowadays there's not a single formation of Russian vessels that isn't being constantly shadowed by NATO submarines. Diesel electric Electric subs are best suited to short duration operations, but American and British nuclear powered submarines are perfect for tracking and staying in close contact with Russian ships. Due to their nuclear reactors, they have even greater endurance than the ships they're tracking, and their incredibly stealthy characteristics means there's an excellent chance they could open fire on Russian surface vessels and escape before being fired upon. However, NATO also has formidable long-range anti-ship missiles at its disposal, such as the Harpoon, Koromon 2, and AGM-119 Penguin. The U.S.'s new LRA <laughs> Penguin. ASM long-range anti-ship missile even features stealthy characteristics and a classified range that allows aircraft to engage enemy ships from outside their air defense envelopes. To get to the safety of the open sea, Russian ships have to pass through a gauntlet of NATO anti-ship defenses, which is one major reason why Russia never invested as heavily into its navy as the West did. In the case, And we've spoke about this before. A weak navy is a weak military, period. I don't care how strong your infantry groups are. I don't care how strong your air force is. Granted, air force is a very, very valuable asset. But if you don't have a strong navy, on a as long as the war keeps escalating or a war keeps escalating, it will always revert back to having a good navy. And if you haven't got one, eventually I think you'll um, succumb to the other military who has a better navy. And 
you know, America has a formidable navy. The size, the technology, the um, the structure, most importantly, all right? They've got a brilliant, brilliant navy. And that's where we win. That's where they lose. Simple as that, guys. ...of a war with NATO, the Russian fleet is simply not survivable if it attempts to break out into the Atlantic. And the addition of Finland and Sweden to the alliance only further squeezes the noose around the Russian Navy. In short, Putin's arming of its surface ships with nuclear weapons is nothing more than a pointless show of force. But the old Russian bear has long ago lost its teeth. I agree, guys. The old Russian bear has long lost its teeth. And um, I can't wait for all of this crap to be over, to be honest with you. I mean, yes, we are um, doing reactions to it and stuff like that. But we need a change of story, don't we? You know, we really do. It's like, come on, man. This is happening in 2023. Really? Come on. Let's let's move on from this. Let's start reacting to, you know, something else. But that was a great video, again, by The Epigraphic Show. Guys, listen to me for a few moments. I am putting ad-free, uncensored content out on my Patreon. It literally costs a coffee a month. Go join that right now. Link is in the description. It's your way of helping me stay here as a content creator. And you get to see stuff that I can't physically put on YouTube. So by going there, you're going to expand what you can view. If you're a fan and a supporter, please, please, please go and join Patreon right now. Link's in the description. I'm putting more and more content out there every day. But other than that, troops, thank you. Like, share, subscribe. I will see you very, very soon.